So I'm waiting to see if anyone comments and says hi. If you're watching, please tell me hi. Tell me where you're from. Uh, and uh, tell me that you're excited to do some gluten-free baking with me so that I can get some enthusiasm. <laughs> because I hate talking to cameras. I need people. So anyway, I'm just really excited that we have this opportunity to teach the class and I think we're ready to start. So um, as soon as Daniel gives us the word, he's going to come over and have our opening prayer. Did you do the recipe? Yes. All right, let's go. I think ready. We're ready, to, ready to start. All right, welcome again. I know we've been on for a few minutes, but we're officially starting. So why don't we have a word of prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, Lord, we're just thankful for your blessings towards us and, and for this opportunity to have this class. I pray that you will be with us this evening, uh, be with each one who is uh, watching and tuning in, and Lord, that, uh, that you may not only bless the food, but that you will bless all those who are using these recipes later on. In Jesus' name, amen. So gluten-free baking is one of those things that seems rather scary, especially at first. If you find out that you're allergic to wheat um, or you can't have gluten, it's like, what do I cook with? What do I bake with? And last month, we explored the option of being able to, um, Daniel, you can use my computer if you need to. You want to pull up my laptop? <laughs> ah, Johnny Miller is watching from Corbin and Michelle Yay! Perkins is watching. Yay! Why don't you pull up my computer so you can tell me the comments as they come in. She says um, she'll come out and be, her, be your taste tester. Yeah, Michelle. well, you need to come out. Like, <laughs> we need you here. I need some, like, people here. Actually, I'm really excited. We're going to be opening uh, the cooking class for live in person probably in the next month or two. So I'm really excited about that because I hate talking to cameras. But gluten-free baking um, is one of those things that when I... Uh, first found out that I was struggling with some wheat allergies. I was like, what do I eat? What do I cook? How can I make all these fun things that I used to love making? Uh, you know, things like muffins or cookies or um, bread, you know, all these uh, uh, desserts and all these things that are, you know, pies. What am I going to do about a pie crust and all these things that we think about? And it's like, huh? You know what kind of diet am I gonna eat? Am I just gonna eat like salad? <laughs> like what do you eat? And uh, so, as I began to explore the world of gluten-free baking, I discovered that it's really not that bad. Um, yes, it is different. It's not the same as wheat. It has different texture. It might be a little heavier, um, but it can really taste good. And that's the most important thing. Not only if we can make it taste good, but also make it healthy as well. And so I want to show you a couple of recipes tonight. Uh, we'll see how much time we have. Um, but uh, the first one I want to show you is our gluten-free muffins. And this is a recipe that's very unique. Um, I have not found anybody else with a recipe like what we have for our gluten-free muffins. And it is not on our website yet. So I'm going to call on Daniel. I think he's got my computer out now. Um, I'm going to call him out to... Uh, to put a PDF copy in the comments of the recipes that we're using tonight. And uh, that way you can follow along, you can print them out or whatever you need to do um, or look at them because it's not on my website yet. Uh, but um, so for gluten-free muffins, the first thing that you have to decide is what flour am I gonna use? And most people like to use gluten-free all-purpose flour. And I think, uh, you have my laptop out yet, Daniel? That's, that's why I'm waiting for you to pull out here. Um, if you can get that laptop out, that way we can easily see the comments and you can put the PDFs and everything on there for me. Um, now, what was I saying? I don't remember. <laughs> gluten-free flour. Gluten-free flour. A lot of people use the gluten-free uh, all-purpose mix. And um, I don't need it on the table. You can just have it over there, but anyway. It'll be easier for you to operate cameras and computers at the same time if they're all together in one place. Uh, I personally cannot use gluten-free all-purpose flour mixes because most of them have at least one or two flours that I'm allergic to. If you can use them, you can absolutely, in my recipe, you can totally replace the flour with the gluten-free all-purpose flour mixes. Uh, that's not a problem, and uh, so feel free to use whatever. 
Uh, if you're like me and you have a lot of allergies, one of the biggest allergies I have is to chickpea flour. And that is in almost all gluten-free flour mixes. And the ones that don't have the chickpea flour are usually like all starch. Um, like you'll see these mixes that are like, you know, potato starch, tapioca starch, uh, uh, corn starch, um, I, and the list goes on. It's like by the time you've read the list of like eight starches, it's like, is this even good for you? <laughs> you know? uh, a little bit, of, you know, starch is not going to hurt you at all, but to eat something that's like pure starch, like I like things that are more of the whole grain feel, that have more fiber, more nutrition than just plain refined starch. So it sent me on a quest to find my favorite flowers. And uh, if you were on a couple months ago and we did the gluten-free pancakes, you know that uh, two of my favorite flours are uh, brown rice flour and uh, also the buckwheat flour. Those two are wonderful gluten-free flours and I really like them. But today I'm going to introduce you to another one of my favorite gluten-free flours and that is sorghum flour. Uh, Daniel, did you have a chance to find the recipe or are you still looking for it? I'm still looking for it. All uh, right. I, I can find it on that. Well, I think uh, if you need some help, I can help you find it really quick. Let me, let me see what we can do here. Do we have any comments yet? Because I am, yeah. I need to. Do okay, you want to just do it from the other computer? Just put that on Facebook for me so I can see the comments, and then you can use the other computer. Because I just want, I want to see some comments. <laughs> I need some people interaction. We're short staffed today, I'm really sorry. Uh, usually I've got one more uh, person in charge of reading comments to me, and uh, I don't have that tonight. So poor Daniel is trying to run all the computer equipment and look at the comments all at the same time. Um, so the flower I want to introduce you to is sorghum flower. Uh, sorghum flower uh, is actually the seeds from the sorghum plant. Uh, the sorghum plant is kind of, when it grows, it, it almost looks like a corn stalk, but it's not corn. Um, but uh, it has the stalk and it's got tassels and it's got leaves, but never has, you know, any ears of corn on it. And the stalks are naturally uh, wonderful. Now I get to see them. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, the stalks are naturally sweet. And uh, when you grind them, it's almost like a sugar cane. When they grind up the juice, uh, grind them into juice, I should say, uh, they boil it down and they turn it into sorghum molasses. And uh, sorghum molasses is a wonderful sweetener. I like to use it, but I'm way off track. Um, so that same plant in the tassels produces a little bitty seed, very tiny. And that is the sorghum seed. And they grind that seed into flour and that's where you get your gluten-free sorghum flour. Um, so it's not a grain, it's actually a seed. And uh, it um, works very well. Uh, it has a, a rich, nutty, almost like a whole grain flavor. Hi, Valerie, it's good to see you. I see you're watching from West Virginia. Uh, welcome, we're glad that you're here with us too. Uh, so um, sorghum has like, it's almost the most similar in taste to whole wheat of any of the gluten-free flours that I've tried. That's the sorghum flour. Um, it has that brown color, um, that whole wheat texture. It's got lots of fiber in it. It's very healthy. And uh, so I like to use sorghum flours, uh, flour excuse me, in my muffins. You can also use sorghum flour in my brown rice pancakes that I demonstrated um, a couple months ago, but uh, you will have to use more flour because it doesn't absorb as much of the liquid as the rice does. So um, that's another thing when you're switching out flours, you'll notice each flour absorbs more liquid or less liquid. And so when you're taking a recipe and you're like, I want to take that gluten-free flour and swap it out for this one, you have to realize that you may have to add a little bit more liquid or a little less liquid, uh, depending on which flour it is. So sorghum is one of those um, 
that doesn't absorb as much water as brown rice flour. Uh, but it still absorbs a fair bit. And then the other thing that uh, when you're gluten-free baking is that you actually want your batter more liquidy when you put it in the oven than regular batter. Because somehow, and I don't know how it works, but gluten-free flour, uh, it absorbs less water or initially, but as it bakes, it absorbs more water than your whole wheat. So if you're taking a whole wheat flour recipe and you're gonna say, I really like my recipe, I wanna keep it, but I wanna change it to gluten-free. I'm gonna take the whole wheat flour out of it and I'm gonna replace it with sorghum flour. You're gonna have to put more sorghum flour in to give the same consistency as you did the, with the whole wheat. So you have to increase the flour a little bit and then you have to remember, make sure and leave it a little more soupy than it looked like when you did the whole wheat because when it bakes, it's gonna bake drier. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense, but um, you'll see more when I do the muffins. So, uh, sorghum flour is my main flour that I'm using instead of a mix. And because I'm not using a mix, uh, you do have to add a little bit of starch to your flour um, just to help it hold together a little bit better. And so I put a little bit of tapioca uh, starch or tapioca flour. It's the same thing. It comes from the tapioca root and, uh, or I should say the cassava root. <laughs> the cassava root, uh, they take that and they get, uh, they make it into flour and uh, turn it into just the starch. And that's what tapioca flour or uh, tapioca starch is. Cassava flour on the other hand is just where they take the cassava and they grind it up and they leave all the, the roots and pieces in it. So it, it's got like these little brown speckles in it from the, the little strings inside the cassava plant or the cassava root. But anyway, um, I hope I'm making sense. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to holler them in the chat. I am keeping an eye on the chat. Uh, so feel free to holler any questions you have as I go along. So with our recipe, we're gonna do one cup and a quarter of sorghum flour. And I'm gonna be doing this in two bowls as we go along because I want you to see both, both recipes. I want you to see the blueberry muffins and what I call my double chocolate muffins, but there's no chocolate in it. They're carob, uh, double carob muffins. So we're gonna do the flour in both of them. And uh, Daniel, were you able to get the recipe up so people could see it? Or are you still working on that? Still working on that. Okay, well it will be up soon, so just be patient. All right, so. Um, well, let me comment and it makes sense I'm gonna have to copy and paste your recipe Okay, that's fine. It'll let you comment after it's not live anymore, probably. Right. Okay. Maybe you can make it as a separate post on Facebook instead of putting a comment. I, I just, do that too. Um, that way it's easy to get to because otherwise if, if it's a comment, it'll be seen once and it'll disappear. So we need a cup and a quarter for the, I'm gonna have to remember which one's which here. Um, how can I mark it? Uh, maybe I will put the carob powder next to this one on this side. I don't know, this one is gonna be my, my double care of muffins. There we go. Uh, so we need a cup and a quarter in the care of muffins and we need a cup and a half in the blueberry muffins. The reason we have more flour in the blueberry muffins is because there's care of powder in the other ones, and that counts as part of your dry ingredients. So we cut the flour a little bit back. Okay, so we got our sorghum flour in there, and then we're just gonna put a quarter cup of tapioca. Yes, Johnny, I said double chocolate. <laughs> I really did. <laughs> but it's carob. It's just like chocolate, but it's double because it's got both the powder and the chips in it, so that makes it double. I see Daniel's got the ingredients there, so I hope you can see them. 
And if you can't, he's going to put it in the, uh, the PDF and the Facebook post as well. Um, Putting it as an image. As an image? Okay, that works. Put it as an image file so you can see the recipe. Okay, what did I say? A quarter cup of, of uh, tapioca? Yes. Quarter cup of tapioca. Tapioca flour is just like starch. You can replace it with any starch and you won't really notice um, a difference. And so. Uh, got tapioca in there. So that's our flour. It's a lot simpler for me. I, I like being able to choose my flours as opposed to doing a mix. But like I said, if you want to just do that whole thing as a mix, you would do one and a half cups of the mix and one and three quarters of a cup of the mix um, or vice versa, I guess. But anyway, you get the idea. And hopefully you learned about a new flour that's gluten free. Sorghum flour. So are those on there now? Mm -hmm. All right. So if you want to look at the recipe, the whole recipe as is, um, it is on a Facebook, um, separate Facebook post, or you can look at the comments and I think he, couple, he uh, uh, copied it in. Johnny, you're double salivating. That's wonderful. Maybe you should just come on over and eat some afterwards. <laughs> All right. So the next thing in our carob muffins is the carob powder. Um, and I need a third cup of carob powder. This is, yeah. Next to tapioca. The messiest powder in the world. I think it's worse than tapioca. It's worse than tapioca. <laughs> Definitely. Unless you're wearing black. <laughs> All right, now I have no uh, question as to which one is the double chocolate muffin. <laughs> really quick. Do I need to cook rice for Asian? Yes. How much? So um, I can get it going. I just thought of that. Four, four cups. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, we're bringing it up here so you can see what's in her bowls. Yeah, there we go. So the next ingredient is um, dandy blend. And if you've never heard of dandy blend, you may have heard of um, uh, other types of um, instant like coffee instant substitute. coffee replacements, uh, like. Uh, Pero, that's one of the more common ones, or Roma. Um, Postum is one of the old, old ones from years ago. Uh, any of those will work. My favorite is the Dandy Blend. It actually has roasted dandelion root in it. And uh, the reason we're putting this in, I'm putting in one and a half tablespoons, is uh, because carob is naturally sweet, while chocolate is naturally bitter. And so to put a little bit of a coffee substitute in there helps to add that, not bitter flavor, but that strong flavor of the chocolate, uh, which carob naturally does not have. So it kind of works together with the carob to give more of that chocolatey taste. Um, so let's see. It still doesn't taste exactly like chocolate, but it's the best tasting carob you ever ate. And it is very close. Okay, so, and then as far as my beret for the chia seed and the flax seed, this is my egg replacer. Um, and Daniel's got it already plugged in for me. How nice. I've got a good husband. So, Johnny, I said that just for you. Um, but anyway, uh, let's see. I need one and a half tablespoons of flax seed. And I like to use the golden flax seed. It has a milder flavor. Although both kinds of flaxseed will work just fine, especially in the double chocolate because you won't see it, right? Um, and I'm going to put one and a half tablespoons of flaxseed in there. And then the chia seed, this is black chia seed. My favorite is actually the white chia seed. But uh, because um, I can get black in bulk easier than I can get white, um, I'm using black chia. So there's my one and a half tablespoons of chia and flax. And I mix them together. I put them in a coffee grinder 
and then uh, we make noise. are both egg replacers and uh, the flax seed is a really good egg replacer and the chia seed is a good egg replacer but something magical happens when you mix them half and half uh, because the chia seed tends to be a little bit more moist and gummy than the flax seed the flax seed tends to be more heavy and so um, when you mix the the heavier flax seed with the moist and lighter but gummy uh, chia seed, they kind of cancel each other out and you end up with a really good combination that makes it really light and fluffy and very moist. that it keeps it so moist um, as well as helps make it fluffy so um, but the other thing you have to realize is when you do put flax and chia in a recipe uh, it is going to absorb a lot of your liquid so you do have to add um, extra liquid to your recipe um, obviously egg has liquid in it so if you're taking a recipe it calls for egg and you're replacing it um, you want to make sure that you have enough water or liquid of some sort to replace that liquid that would have been the egg. So we've got our flaxseed and chia seed. I also like to put in a tablespoon of whole flaxseed. Uh, part of it is because if you ground all of it, it tends to make it more gummy. But Okay, that's fine. But uh, the other reason that we use a little bit of whole flaxseed is for look. I know that sounds funny, but when you can see some flaxseed in your food, it looks healthier. <laughs> you're not going to argue with me because you're not right. But uh, anyway, um, the yeah, it's like having some visual, even though there's more flaxseed in it, of course, uh, that's ground and whatever. But having some whole flax, you just makes it look healthier. Um, but it does that also tastes healthier too. It, yeah, of course, it tastes healthier when you got pieces of flax in. But it also does help uh, keep it from being too yummy. Do we have any more comments, Daniel? I'm just okay. only half looking over here. I don't, I don't see any more. Okay. It's, Good. it's having trouble pulling up on the phone. Or something. All right. Talk to me, you guys. <laughs> Did you share this to my page? Yes. Okay, good. All right. So let's uh, let's see. We've got our flax seed, our whole in our ground. We got our chia seed. We have our flour. We've got our carob and dandelion. So we need some uh, flavor stuff, like sugar, something to make it sweet, right? I do use um, organic sugar in my muffins, but you can also use the um, turbinado or sucanat, uh, and if you want to make it more healthy, um, you can increase the banana and uh, add some applesauce and decrease the sugar and make them more into like uh, breakfast muffins that are not really sweet um, but still taste good. So that is an option. It will make them heavier when you do that, but it is an option if you're trying to go for low sugar. Um, but we need... Um, what do we need here? Three quarters cup of organic sugar. So we're gonna put in, whoop. Half. Three quarters. Do that in the other one. Half. Ah. 
three quarters. Okay. So we got some sweetener. Now we need some salt. How much salt do we need? Half a teaspoon. Half a teaspoon here. There we go, and then we've got, um, I've got some aluminum free baking powder. Vanilla goes in both of them, or I'm not sure. Let me see. Help us out yes. on your recipe, guys. You have them. Yes, vanilla oh. goes in both of them. And then we're going to put some cinnamon. Cinnamon is totally optional in the double chocolate muffins, but it does give a more robust flavor, um, so I really like it. dry ingredients now. So we are going to mix this up and I don't have a whisk. I need a whisk. So if you have any other questions, Holler them out, or comments, or whatever you want to do. <laughs> okay, so we are going to whisk all our dry ingredients together. And I think it's perfectly clear which one is which. You can tell by color. There is no question. Yep. I'm gonna need, I'm gonna 
gonna need uh, one more plate though. Because I get two banana smash. How much carrot chips? We need a half a cup of carrot chips. This is about to make the double, the double, double chocolate, double carob, whatever you want to call it. We got carob in there twice. Double chocolate, chocolate in it. Yes. <laughs> so these are carob chips. They're also gluten free and dairy free. Thank you. All right, boy. So we're gonna mash some banana here. You can mix up all your dry ingredients and then just store it and add your liquid wet ingredients when you're ready to make the muffins. That is exactly what I said. Uh, I do that actually with my pancake mix, that gluten-free pancakes uh, that we had um, a couple months ago. If you were here when we did those uh, brown rice pancakes, they were so good. Um, I do the same thing with that. I make a, um, I just make whatever size of batch I want. Like this recipe here. These are going to make about 12 muffins each, 10 to 12, depending on how big you make them and how big your muffin tins are. It might be 10. Um, if I know that I want to make, say, I want to make 24 muffins in a batch, then I would double the recipe and stick it in a gallon Ziploc bag and uh, do each bowl the same and then put each one in a bag so I know how much it is. Right down, I always put down the date that I make the mix uh, so I know how old it is and uh, it's best stored in the freezer or the fridge so it doesn't spoil you can leave it out for a week if you need to uh, but i try not to leave it more than that humidity will get to it and ruin it eventually but um, yeah i with the pancake mixes i'm like well you know how many how many pancakes do i want to make um, and i just make a whole bunch of mixes and i tell you it makes it so fast and easy when you actually want to make some muffins uh, to already have your mixes done and ready to go. Um, here at the restaurant, I don't always have time to do my baking uh, all in one day. So sometimes we will uh, like make the muffin mix for however many muffins we're going to make that week. We'll make it the day before and uh, then the day of, all I have to do is add the wet ingredients and it goes so much faster. Um, so that is definitely uh, something that saves a lot of time. When you're busy and you only have a few minutes, uh, you can do things in smaller, smaller bites, you might say, and it works very well. So, on your bananas, you want them very ripe. Uh, you can see my bananas are nicely speckled. That's what you want. Nice, beautiful, speckled ripe bananas. You don't want them black, of course. As you can see, they're still white inside. And... Uh, Let's see, where can I put this? A banana in? is not white inside, it's not edible. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a trash can here. Um, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I'll take them. Sorry, Daniel. <laughs> Thank you. So we've got our two bananas. We are going to mash them. And for the blueberry ones, it really doesn't matter how fine you mash it. Um, for the double chocolate, it does because I don't like, you know, <laughs> chunks of banana in my double chocolate muffin. But uh, um, you want them well mashed. Some people like to mash it with a fork. I can't stand mashing with a fork. I don't have the patience for that. So I mash it with a potato masher. And uh, a lot of people have asked me, why don't you do this, this recipe by weight like you do your gluten-free muffins? I mean, bread, excuse me. Because the gluten-free bread, we did everything with a scale. And this one, we're doing everything by cups and we're not even measuring the banana. Um, for me, like, I feel like the muffins, the recipe is more versatile. And you've got a little bit more room, marginal room for error. Um, so it's not like, not like the bread where it's mission critical, where if it's one gram off, it's going to be a problem type of thing. Um, but I've also noticed with bananas, depending on how ripe they are, will depend on how juicy they are. And so you can have some bananas that are a little more green, they're a little more dry, and you're going to have to add more milk to your recipe. And then you got other bananas 
that are really, really soupy. And so depending on the ripeness of your banana will depend on how much uh, liquid you need to put in your recipe. So that's why I don't bother weighing or measuring everything. Uh, I'm less precise with my muffins and uh, they seem to turn out okay. So that's good. Besides, who wants to, you know, if I said it has to be exactly one cup of banana, then you're stuck with like this open banana. It's like, what do I do with the rest of it? I guess I could give it to Daniel and he could eat it. But anyway, he's not usually here when I make muffins. <laughs> Sorry, my bowls are annoying. I'm trying to stop clanking once. It, it, the bowl is just... It's, not, it's on a glass. Oh, that's the problem. It's on a glass. Look at that. Now it's quiet. Er. Arrange everything so it doesn't clank. <laughs> <laughs> If you have just recently joined us, I want to welcome you, um, and please tell me who you are, where you're from in the comments. Um, I like to hear from people. I can't stand talking to a screen, so don't be afraid to talk. I like the I like having people to talk to. So comment away. Say hi to your grandmother. I think she's watching. Hi, Grandma. Say hi if you're watching. Okay, so. I've got my banana mashed. The next thing I need to do is I need to put my blueberries in. My blueberries are still in the freezer. Uh, I don't want to let them thaw. Um, I've learned the mistake of what happens if you let your blueberries thaw before you put them in. Um, you end up with solid blue muffins, which after they bake is kind of like this weird, strange, brownish, weird uh, looking color of muffin. So you want your blueberries either fresh, because then they're firm, or you want them frozen, and you want them frozen when they go in your batter. And you want to put them in the dry ingredients before you add your wet ingredients. So I'm going to grab my blueberries out of the freezer. And the recipe says three quarters cup of blueberries, I think. I don't know, maybe you can see it better faster than I can. Yes, it says three quarters cup. I like blueberries. So I go heaping. I do a whole cup. <laughs> um, but three quarters cup is the, is the right amount. I just like extra. So I'm allowed to do that, right? Um, to give it the recipe and then change it before the, before the day. Well, not everybody likes as many blueberries in their muffins as I do. <laughs> if you get, I don't recommend doing more than a cup. That's the most you'd want to do because if you get too many blueberries in your muffins, what happens is they end up they end up falling apart and the blueberries end up burning to the side of your muffin tin and you can't get the muffins out. So, one cup is your max. Three quarters of a cup is your minimum. The heaping cup. There, there was a big chunk that was keeping it from filling it. Somebody out. else likes blueberries too. I'm so happy. Welcome, Susan. I'm glad you can join us. If there's anyone else joining us, tell me where you're from. I love to hear from you. Okay, so I've got my blueberries in the dry ingredients and I've got a few clumps here so I'm going to break them apart because I don't want too many frozen clumps of blueberries in my muffins. So now that I've got them in, my timer has started because I don't want these to thaw before I get the wet ingredients in. That's why I mashed the bananas first um, and got that done. I think I've got most of the blueberries unstuck from each other now. So um, we are going to put in a mashed banana.
put in two ripe bananas. And the recipe calls for one. I'm used to doing a double batch. Uh oh. So, I have extra banana now. Can you scoop half of it out and put it in the other one? Yeah. That's probably what I should do. I'm used to making a double batch. I don't usually make this small of a recipe, so I just naturally did uh, without looking. And none of you corrected me. We only need one banana. Okay. So you got you got extra mashed banana. I've got extra mashed banana, but that's okay. I'll just have to adjust it with the soy milk. Okay. But don't put it all in. I'm not putting it all in. I've got extra here. It was supposed to be a large banana, and those are smaller, so we're okay. Okay, so we've got our banana in. We just need our olive oil. Third cup. Is that right? Yes. Third cup of olive oil. I'm used to restaurant proportions. When we make muffins here at the restaurant, we make like a hundred muffins at a time. So I'm used to big giant recipes. I'm not used to such a tiny little recipe anymore. Okay, and then our soy milk goes in. We need one cup of soy milk. And for soy milk, if you are trying to do soy free, uh, you can use almond milk instead. Um, soy and almond are almost interchangeable. Uh, soy is a little bit, it makes them a little bit more light and fluffy than almond does but uh, you don't notice a huge difference. So if you're looking for soy free, uh, this recipe is best with almond milk. I do not recommend using coconut milk for this recipe because it would be too heavy. So we're just gonna mix this up here and we want a fairly soupy batter. So if it looks like it's a little bit too thick, I generally add a little bit more soy milk. Although this is looking pretty good. And the other, um, huh, the other nice thing about gluten free is you don't have to worry about over stirring it because guess what? It's not going to get tough from the gluten. You do have to worry about over stirring it for the baking powder though. There we go. That looks good. You don't want to over stir your baking powder, but you don't have to worry about getting tough. It's in there. You're probably reading. All right, we're going to stir this one up now. Looking good. And you can see this one is definitely drier. So we're going to add a little bit more soy milk to this because we don't want it quite that dry. to sit for about five minutes so that uh, that um, flax seed can start to activate and then it'll activate a little bit more while I'm putting it in the pans. The most you want to let it sit is 10 minutes um, but the least amount is five. So this one's already been sitting for a couple minutes while I was mixing that one up. But we're going to give it just a couple more minutes and I'm going to clean up my mess just a little bit. Uh, and then we're going to transition into the other recipe as soon as uh, I get those in the pans. Do I have time for one more recipe? I don't know what time it is. Yeah, you got time. We got time? Okay, good. Because I want to do one. I don't want to do just muffins today. I want to share with you just a little bit more um, as well. So let me clear up a couple things here real quick. If 
you have any other questions, tell me them. I want to hear from you. How much more time do we have left? Anyone watching the time for me? Can you give me the little six, one of the little six inch, I mean six hole pans, just so I can show you. more space here to work now I think. Um, I'm going to need one more one cup measuring cup, Daniel. One more. And I think my five minutes for the blueberry is almost over. By the time I get the blueberry in pans, the other one will be ready. So these are the pans, the gigantic pans, that we use for muffins here in the restaurant um, for home. Obviously, you would just be using two of these. Uh, one recipe will make about two of these uh, as far as muffins. Um, but for my bakery oven, I'm going to use this big giant one, and it's just going to fill both. It's going to fill the whole thing with both uh, both kinds of muffin. So I've got to, to spray. If you have a non-stick, you don't have to spray, but if yours is not non-stick, like mine is not, you will need to spray it so it does not stick. And the way I have it here, you can't see a thing. So let me move a couple things here. And you'll be able to I will be able to you got to be able to see with the other camera. So, this should work. All right. So, I usually put them basically just to the, almost to the top of the muffin tin. a mess here too it looks like. I think I need my bowl closer to me. Where I'm working. There we go. Now I can get it better. Got lots of blueberries in them, just how I like them. This one's a little too full. Extra batter, so that means I can actually top off some of my muffins a little higher, which is nice. Muffins, the blueberry ones. And I usually try to wipe up some of my mess so it doesn't burn on the sides. And now we're ready to do the 
cherub ones. Have a way to get a clean spoon here, so we're just gonna. Have you ever tried taking both kinds of batter and just like swirling them together in the same muffin? Have a, have a blueberry cherub swirl muffin. I've done that with cake. I did a, a blueberry carob swirl cake. Is it a similar recipe? Yeah. For cake, basically the, the difference with cake is that you need uh, more fat in your recipe. So or more oil or or some some uh, kind of fat, applesauce or whatever you want to put in there. Um, and uh, has a little, you don't put the carob chips in it. Take the care of chips out. Do you use the same recipe to make a cake? Almost. The same. You can use this recipe, yes. With a little modifications, you can make a cake out of this. The best um, type of cake that this recipe makes is a bunt cake, because in a bunt cake pan, it bakes more evenly because it's got the hole in the middle, so the heat travels better. Um, and I have, I have used a similar recipe to this for a bunt cake. There we go. One more out of this pan. So there you have 12 of each kind of muffin. In a 24 hole pan. So we're going to put these in the oven. I don't know what time it is, Daniel. It is 7.01. 7 o'clock. So uh, we will take a picture of it because we won't be able to stick around for the whole class uh, so you can see what they look like after they come out of the oven. But um, there's what they look like before they come out of the oven when they're going in. The oven is heated. If you want to just throw it in and turn the oven down to 350 for me. Um, if you're using a home oven, you want to bake these at 375. Uh, I always preheat my oven to 400 degrees and then uh, bake at 375 um, until they're done. It takes about 25 minutes or so until they're done. But um, if you're using a convection oven, a convection oven bakes hotter. So a convection oven, I do at 350 um, because that, that way it doesn't burn. So Daniel's uh, turning it down to, to 350 for me. You got on 350 for 20 minutes? All right, and then I will check them. <laughs> All right, let me rinse off my fingers. I want to show you one more thing, and then we'll be done. Oh, yeah, there you go. Finish butter. Here is what they look like when they come out of the oven. They got some around there, right? Here. Yeah, you can see it there. There they are, fresh out of the oven. Well, not quite fresh out of the oven. <laughs> <laughs> that is, they're amazing. Oh, they look really good too. <laughs> All right, so I wanted to share one more thing, and that was uh, one of my favorite, very simple um, graham cracker crusts. Uh, when you're running, like right now is strawberry season for us. Strawberries are on, and the first thing that you think of is like, strawberry pie fresh strawberry pie and i wish i could demonstrate for you fresh strawberry pie because you would love it and but i cannot demonstrate fresh strawberry pie daniel will not demonstrate pie strawberry pie yeah we'll we'll uh, let him hang on that one but uh anyway hang by my neck when i make fresh strawberry pie i don't want to bake the strawberries so i want a pre-baked graham cracker crust and guess what graham crackers are made out of wheat and so anyway, I want to show you a super fast and easy recipe for a graham cracker crust that uh, does not um, require much work at all. 
and is completely gluten free. And that is, uh, I use almond flour. Now there's two kinds of almond flour. You can get blanched almond flour, which is more white. And that's what I like to use um, for my graham cracker crust. Um, and the reasons why is because the almonds are peeled, so it doesn't have the peelings on them. Or you can get regular almond flour that's brown, and that works just as well. You really can't taste a huge difference in flavor. There's just a slight difference. Um, but this is the blanched almond flour. And we're going to use uh, one and a half cups of almond flour. And then we're going to put in um, a little bit of salt. And if you want a little more flavor, you can add cinnamon or vanilla or whatever flavor you want. We're just going to put a whew, loud quarter teaspoon of salt. Doesn't take much. And uh, I like a little bit of cinnamon in mine. And then we're going to put in, um, for our liquid, we're going to put in two tablespoons of maple syrup. So this is our liquid, which becomes both our liquid and our sweetener. So that way we're not putting any sugar in our pie, just the maple syrup. And then we're going to put in um, two to three tablespoons of melted coconut oil. I'm going to start with two and mix it up, and if I need more, I'll add the third one. And to melt your coconut oil is very easy. You can put it in warm water, um, or you can uh, you can put it in the toaster oven. Uh, there's so many ways you can melt it. It doesn't take very much heat. Uh, microwave, of course, will melt it easily. It doesn't take much heat to melt coconut oil. Um, it melts at 78 degrees. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and put my other tablespoon in there. You want to make sure that you're not getting it too wet or else it will get soggy. But this looks about perfect. If it's too soggy, you just add a little more almond flour to it. No problem. So then you take your pan and you spray it. I know it looks like crumbs, okay? But seriously, do not panic. It pats together beautifully. But what I do is I spread the crumbs out across the pan and then I pat it into place. And it pats into this perfect graham cracker crust. Um, and the nice thing is this crust does not take long to bake. Uh, it actually bakes in 10 minutes. I think that's what I put on there. Yeah, 10 to 12 minutes. And then the secret is when you're doing this crust, you want to make sure that you cool it well. Make sure it's cooled very thoroughly um, because uh, it, if you like have warms fresh from the oven and then you pour your wet strawberry mixture into it if you're doing a strawberry pie or you know whatever kind of pie you're going to do in it, um, it will, or cheesecake or whatever, uh, it will turn soggy. So if you take it out of the oven and let it cool completely, it can even cool till the next day if you want to make it the day before. Um, or make it earlier and stick it in the freezer or whatever you want to do. But as long as it's good and cool before you put it in, then it's not going to turn soggy. At least not the first day or two of the pie. So you're uh, actually just putting pressure on that to push it up the sides of the Yeah, I'm just pan. gently pushing it up the sides, make, trying to make sure it's even. You can kind of tell by feeling it how thick it is. I mean, isn't this nice? You don't even have to roll it out. Like, how much easier can it get? And uh, this is also really nice if you're looking for a low-carb crust, um, as well as gluten-free, because it's just almonds. 
And if you don't want to use almonds, you can use pecans. You can grind them up if you want. Um, and if you don't want to use oil, if you're trying to go for an oil-free graham cracker crust, you can do equal, instead of um, using the maple syrup and coconut oil, you do equal portions of nuts to dates. And you blend it up in the food processor. And uh, then pat it in just like I'm doing and bake it the same way. In fact, you don't even have to bake the one with dates in it. You can just leave it and use it as is, or you can bake it, either one. Um, but uh, that one is uh, completely oil-free and sugar-free and very easy to make. So there we go. There it is. Now I just need a fork. I should have accepted Lexi's fork when she offered it. But, um, Daniel, can you grab a fork I'll get a fork. fork. i got to put this camera down. <laughs> You want to use a fork to poke it just a little bit to keep it from making like big air bubbles um, in your in your pie crust. So just like a regular pie crust, you gotta poke it. Thank you, Daniel. I didn't want to stick my hands in there with the pie crust all over them. I'm just gonna poke this around. made a cheesecake with this for church a couple weeks ago and it was a huge hit like you can hardly tell that it wasn't a real graham cracker crust it tastes so amazing and um, you made the cheesecake out of bird seed I did made it out of millet and it was yummy maybe sometime we'll do a cheesecake for our online class as well Alrighty. So that's ready. It just goes in the oven for 10 minutes and you cool it and it's ready for whatever you want to use it for. So I know our time is up. I want to thank you all for joining us. It was a lot of fun to have you. Thanks for your comments. And uh, Daniel, will you close us with a word of prayer? Sure. Before I do, I want to, I want to tell you, after all that Christina has demonstrated and all that hard work of, of making the muffins and the pie crust and everything, I want to show you the easy and simple way that I get those things without having to do all of the work. Now, you can't try this at home, but Christina, can I have a muffin? <laughs> <laughs> Did you yes. show them the muffins? Daniel gets lots of muffins. I get lots of muffins, and I'm, I'm thoroughly spoiled by this wonderful lady. And, uh, so I hope you all enjoyed the class. And, uh, you can always come to Christina's kitchen and I'll sell you all the muffins you want to buy. <laughs> and I don't even have to pay for mine. <laughs> Did you show them? Yes. Yeah, we should have them up yeah. there. Yes. So, why, don't, why don't we have a word of prayer to close? Father in heaven, thank you for this day. Thank you for this class that we were able to have and for each one who is watching and those who may be watching later. Pray that you will bless them and, and continue to bless us through this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for coming. I hope you'll join us again next month on the third Tuesday at 6 p.m. We'll be doing another really fun class. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all there. And until then, come see me here at Christina's Kitchen. Have a great night.